please uh, welcome Carmen Helena Guerrero Nieto, uh, Universidad Distrital, and Brian Meadows, Firlo Dickinson University, Inter Intercultural Competence in Second Language Teacher Education, Creating Deterritorialized oh, Spaces. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um, good afternoon. Is it afternoon yet? Yes, no? it is. Good afternoon, everyone. And we're also uh, proud graduates from the SLAP program, so we're very happy to be uh, back in Tucson at the University of Arizona. Yes. And uh, we'll get right into it. We wanted to start with a little bit of background um, regarding the origins of our study. Uh, we are both uh, teacher educators. We work primarily with non-native English speaker teachers uh, in our graduate programs. Um, I, I'm located in the United States, and many of my students are pre-service um, pre teachers. That is, they have uh, very little experience, if any experience at all, as a teacher in a classroom. Mm -hmm. And many of my students are classified as international students in my context, uh, entering the United States from China, Saudi Arabia, et cetera. And I am located in Colombia. I was teaching an MA cor a class uh, in, a, in a small city near Bogota. My students are all Colombian and non-native speakers. And um, they are what we would call uh, experts uh, because all of them had at least seven years of experience teaching. And we came together at least a year ago with this a uh, very exciting opportunity to bring our two groups of students together mm -hmm. using online technology so that they could engage with one another in critical dialogue during um, a regular course semester. Yeah, so what we did was to use this platform called Stoology that is a social, uh, I'm sorry, educational networking site. And the idea was to uh, have this, uh, engage our students, MA students in what we call a critical dialogue to know what, um, they, the, the themes that would um, concern them in terms of um, intercultural competence. Uh, these dialogues uh, happened during one semester and we posted three main readings in the, the site uh, to promote the dialogue. Um, and our main idea was to have, to, pro to give this deteriorized space where they could dialogue because otherwise these two sets of participants couldn't meet in, in a geographical area. Can you talk more on your mic? Oh, okay. Thank you. Here. Okay. And here's a, a quick view of the Schoolology site. Uh, many of you, I assume, are familiar with Facebook and other types of networking sites. It's very similar. Users are able to post an update, for example, and then other users are able to see that. Um, update and then post their comments. So it develops a thread running down the, the website. We can also post readings that the students were asked to respond to. And um, also what's interesting about Schoolology is that it's restricted to educational uses. So the theoretical background. So we are approaching intercultural competence. Uh, we're very interested in the critical aspects of intercultural competence. Uh, so we're interested in, uh, in intercultural competence as a way of reshaping conventional boundaries of culture and language, leading us to view the intercultural individual as one who not simply spans boundaries, but is able to reconfigure them in their social practices. Uh, we're influenced heavily by uh, Karen Riesager, her idea of, of intercultural communicative competence, but for world citizenship, which therefore uh, entails a sense of uh, global responsibility for social justice. We're also influenced by Adrian Holliday, um, his discussion of critical cosmopolitanism. That's a, a critical stance towards conventional ideas of cosmopolitanism, which maintains uh, Europe or Western Europe as the center, so Eurocentric ideas of cosmopolitanism. And so he promotes providing, uh, helping to cultivate voice of the periphery. Um, like everyone here, we uh, strongly believe that intercultural competence is an important component of second language teacher education. 
uh, for many reasons, but uh, just for two reasons. One is if students are, if our students are going to enter classrooms and cultivate intercultural competence, then we have to give them a chance to develop their own intercultural competence as language teachers, uh, following the, um, the resources here. Uh, additionally, in, in the particular case of non-native English speaker teachers, um, intercult intercultural competence is an important part of um, helping them develop an empowered professional identity in the field of English language teaching uh, because teachers who are categorized as non-native English speaker teachers, as we know, are historically marginalized um, due to a colonial uh, legacy. For this study, we decided to um, approach as a case study because, given the nature of, of the of the experience of the pedagogical intervention, we were reporting on this particular exchange between these two sets of MA students. Uh, we collected, I'm sorry, we collected the data uh, using the Schoology postings that our students were doing. Uh, we got their consent uh, form signed so we could use all the postings. Uh, there were 26 and in total postings and they were 118 comments because the idea was that someone posted and then the others respond to the postings or dialogue. Um, most of the postings were written but there were also some videos and also some students audio recording their postings. There were some images and some links. Um, also, Brian had the opportunity to conduct semi-structured interviews like one year after. One year after the fact. After mm -hmm. the pedagogical mm -hmm. intervention. For me, it wasn't possible. My students were not available for the uh, interviews. But these interviews help us like um, cross, like uh, triangulate our findings. Um, we also followed a qualitative data analysis methodology. We used memo in first, and then we, we coded all the data um, as we were finding patterns on, or commonalities. And then we did this first like together to establish some common uh, codes. And then we did this on our own, and then we got together again to compare the results in order to build trustworthiness. And what are the results of our qualitative analysis? This is our uh, summative uh, report of the, of the results. And uh, what we did find was that over the course of the semester that four themes developed as the teachers were talking back and forth on the Schoolology website. Uh, these are listed on the left-hand side. The first theme that emerged was uh, what should be the role of English language teaching in a globalized world. Second theme was institutional constraints. Third was whose culture to teach. And then fourth was how to handle language diversity in the ELT classroom. Um, we also observed, too, that the students in both contexts position themselves in the discourse according to their professional status. So what I mean is that the students in Colombia, which we're using a pseudonym, University in Colombia, which is UIC, uh, position, <laughs> uh, it's the middle column. So they position themselves as experts, um, experienced teachers in the discourse. Um, very often, the anecdotes that they brought into the discussion, they drew from their own experience as a teacher. And also, you see that in the didactic expressions that they use, such as here and now. Uh, this was in contrast to the students in the United States, and the pseudonym we're using is United States University, <laughs> USU. Um, and this is a column on the right-hand side. And they position themselves largely as novices, as pre-service teachers, as should be expected. Um, they often use anecdotal evidence uh, from their own experience as students in the classroom, not teachers. And then the appropriate uh, didactic expressions would follow along with that, talking about the future as a teacher, um, projecting themselves into the future. Um, because of time constraints, we're just going to summarize the results of the first two themes at the top, and then we're going to move into themes three and four with representative examples in a little more detail, because we felt like themes three and four were more relevant to intercultural competence. Uh, so theme number one, what should be the role of ELT? The UIC experts talked about English language teaching as a transformative, 
empowering, it's part of social transformation, and that teachers have an important role in that. In contrast, the USU students, uh, for the most part, spoke about English language teaching as providing an economic or social commodity to uh, young people in China, for example, or Saudi Arabia. The second theme, institutional constraints. Uh, UIC experts um, spoke from the teacher perspective about the challenges that they face as teachers in Colombia. They were very critical of packaged curricular models, such as Colombia Bilingue. Uh, in their discourse, also, they promoted locally, revel locally relevant excuse me, language education policy. Um, on the other hand, USU novices, they sympathize and acknowledge with institutional constraints. They could imagine this, but not as teachers, but as students observing their teachers. Um, so that's it. So we'll move into theme three, mm -hmm. which was whose culture to teach. Yes. So um, we found that this was another of the issues that concern our students and is whose culture to teach. We found that uh, we were kind of uh, speculating, but from the uh, University in Colombia participants, we think that their position of supporting this third space um, culture, and they were very sensitive to uh, the dangers of colonialism, but we speculate that it has to do with the fact that they have been teachers for seven years, so they are already in the field, and also that they have been exposed to critical discourses on um, colonialism, linguistic imperialism, as and Brian was mentioning this policy, Colombia bilingue, um, so most of their ideas must come from there, and they have been very critical and vocal about imposition of only teaching the tar target culture that has been, in a subtle way, not very subtle, uh, hidden in mm, materials and in the curriculum and in uh, training courses. So what we see is we're going to show you one of the voices, representative voices, um, that challenge this perspective of only teaching or privileging the target culture. This is Diego, and he is relying on Cramsh to support his view of the third space. So he says, Cram suggests that teachers and learners must create a third culture in the L2 classroom. The third culture is a conceptual space that recognizes the L2 classroom at the site of intersection of multiple worlds of discourse. She recommends that teachers must encourage learners to create this third culture and not allowing either the home culture to the target culture to hold hostage of its particular values and beliefs. Because what we have seen in Colombia is that we Pay too much pay, pay too much attention to the target culture in singular and leave out our own culture. Got it. Okay. Great. All right. Thank you. Um, okay. So there was a, a very uh, clear contrast with the USU novice students. Uh, these students spoke when they thought about what whose culture to teach. They were very firm in the belief that an English class should teach American culture. Uh, so they presented a very essentialized view that uh, linked American culture with English language. And they also, in focus groups, uh, described themselves as a kind of conduit for their future students, that they are here in the United States to learn real, authentic American English, real, authentic American culture. So their job is to return to uh, their home context and then to transmit that to students. One student said, students, listen to me, trust me. I know America. Mm -hmm. I've been there. I spent two years with that Professor Meadows. Uh, so here's one representative example. These are pseudonyms, by the way, all of these students. Uh, they were talking about um, whose culture to teach in the classroom, but then also there was a dialogue, there was a thread talking about should we incorporate the local culture into the L2 classroom. Uh, Mean and Nadia were not happy with that idea. They wrote the following, we disagree, here's the dialogic aspect, we disagree about the idea that English teachers should place more energy on the native culture. Since we study English with the teachers, we should know all things related to the English language, including the American culture. That may be the difference between foreign language class and history class. But we mean, what we mean is that teachers are not prohibited to introduce the native culture, 
but the purpose about what they teach is to let students to learn English well. Uh, so we have a very interesting analogy between um, a language class and a math class, and a very essentialized idea of, of the purpose of teaching, what culture teaching should look like in a language classroom. And the four uh, theme that emerges is how to handle language diversity in the LT classroom. And again, the expert view is that they support diversity on principle. And we think, again, that this is due to the exposition they have to all these critical discourses in Colombia. So what they propose is that they see, they see diversity not only in terms of language and varieties of the language, but also in terms of ways of being in the world and ways of acting in the world. So we have, again, voice, a representative voice from one of our participants um, because she sees the value of diversity um, as a way to get a better world. And I don't know if you know, but we are holding, hope, uh, having peace conversations in Havana. So this theme of tolerance and peace is really important for us right now. So she says, helping our students to understand that there is not one language more important over the other and being aware of how different and similar languages and human beings are could be a good starting point for motivate them to accept differences, accept people how they are, and build a more peaceful world. So again, the idea is to have diversity in a class as a plus and very much in line with our, we're going back to the yes. findings, right? Uh, very much in line with the first finding that sees the English uh, language classroom as transformative and empowering, they don't see the English classroom as just learning the language, but using the language to signify the world and to act in the world. That's what how we see um, how they value diversity in the classroom. Um, oh, I'm sorry. Oh, it's okay. All right. Oops, it's gone. Oh, yes. yeah. oh no. No, it's just, uh... Here's the fun part. Here we are. Okay. okay. <laughs> All right. Back in character. All right, so the USU novice uh, participants were slightly different. Um, these students had a, a more limited view of, of what it means to deal with diversity in the classroom, a limited view of the, um, the purpose of, of language teaching. Uh, so the USU participants were very interested in world Englishes. They were very interested in the idea of standard and non-standard as opposed to correct and incorrect. Mm -hmm. um, but still, the, the students developed a hierarchy for what well, they thought about using, I'm sorry, they thought about using um, different varieties of English in the language classroom for pragmatic and instructional reasons. Um, as um, the previous presenter mentioned, that you cannot have really complex discussions at a beginner level if it's immersion only. So it, there's a ne pedagogical necessity to include both languages. Uh, so the students agreed with that. But they agreed with that as long as it did not impinge on the privilege of the standard mm -hmm. uh, variety. So that was very important. Okay, so here is uh, Chiang speaking, uh, writing October 4th. Uh, she wrote, for me, and this is representative of the other students in this group. Uh, for me, I think it is always good to have the language varieties, showing appreciation. And since there are also many English versions around the world, as a teacher of English, I prefer to focus on the standard English, while I also want to build up the students' awareness that there are also varieties there. What's your opinion, guys? We have dialogue. Very glad to have you here to discuss. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Well, discussion and conclusions. So, uh, yeah. Yeah. so what exactly have we accomplished here? Um, we do believe, and uh, consistent with the literature, that teacher-to-teacher -teacher dialogue is an important part of professional development, an important part of developing a professional identity as a teacher. Uh, what the unique contribution of this study was, this activity was the ability to establish dialogue um, with individuals one would normally have a chance to talk with across these wide uh, geographic spaces. Um, also, we, we advocate for 
uh, professional dialogue amongst non-native English speaker teachers mm -hmm. uh, because of the historical legacy. Mm -hmm. And also, uh, we see that the use and value of using uh, online technologies to put these to put groups together that are long distance, and we kind of find that there was like a dual learning because on the one hand we had these profession this participants talking about issues of the profession but also learning to use uh, the technology and the value of technology um, and actually um, some of Brian's students mentioned they would like to use this site in the, in the future, future. <laughs> to, to engage their students in interaction and some of my students are already using for their classes so we think that there was kind of dual learning here. And finally, uh, regarding intercultural competence, if we're approaching intercultural competence as a form of, of critical practice, then we would conclude that this was a, a worthwhile activity um, for both groups. So for the UIC experts, for example, we, we interpret them as strengthening their critical stance through this dialogue with the novice uh, teachers. Um, because at times they had to justify their particular position mm -hmm. and they had to resort to arguments in order to um, advance their position and why it's important to be a, a critical uh, English language teacher. But at the same time, we also, we also observe the need for these same students to, the same participants, to move from anecdotal evidence to more of a theoretical uh, base Based. for their argument. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, looking at the USU novices, um, we do know, I think it's well established in the teacher education literature that pre-service teachers enter into a teacher education uh, program with entrenched beliefs about how language teaching should happen and, and also literature is showing that those beliefs are resistant to our teacher education program. So um, we weren't expecting a huge epiphany or these huge significant changes in, in student um, the positions they were taking. Um, however, we do feel that exposing uh, the USU novices to these alternative, these kind of critical professional discourses, discourses they hadn't experienced perhaps in the past, will be beneficial to them later on as they enter into the profession as full-fledged um, professionals. They may refer back to these conversations as, as a resource. And I think there is some indication that they may do that because my focus groups took place one year after the Schoolology project and they were very clear and, mm -hmm. and very interested and, and uh, remembered a lot about what the UIC stu uh, participants were saying. Uh, so I, I think that's a positive indication for us. And we are out of time. So thank you very much. Okay. Yeah, they're experts. You, States, experts. Mm -hmm. the mm -hmm. experts. If that would have given you similar results, um, and if you also saw like the trajectory of those pre-service teachers in the U.S., did they move beyond what you were reporting on? Oh, that's that's a great question. Um, so the the U.S.U. novices. I'll hold this. Mm -hmm. So the U.S.U. novices. Um, yeah, I, I think there was some small shift, and I, and I think the world English's discussion, the standard English, non-standard discussion, I think was, was significant. Um, but did it really change their, their, the way that they envisioned their future teaching? I didn't see much there. Um, so if we were able, to, and I think also we shouldn't expect a lot of change yet because they haven't actually entered the profession as full-fledged teachers yet. They're still in that pre-service stage. They're dealing with a lot of ideas and, and trying to negotiate how they respond to that. Um, so if we were able to switch it between novice and experts, between locations, that's well, a, a great question. Yeah. The, the, the thing with the expert and novice is that we were not aware of that at the very beginning. It came up when we were doing the analysis that we saw 
well, your students are, your participants are, aren't in the field yet, while mine are, and we started seeing how this experience uh, affected the type of perceptions and dialogue that took place. So, well, <laughs> I don't know either. But that was something that we didn't count on to have expert novice dialogue. I, I think also just to build on what the idea of the, if we saw a change with the novice students, many of them are returning to educational systems different from the one that I'm familiar with. And these students are going to experience very unique institutional constraints that, that seem to work for that particular situation that may contradict a lot of these ideas and discourses that we're promoting in our situation. So I also have to acknowledge as a teacher educator that I don't have as much control over them. We have time for one more question. I am just... <laughs> That's strange. I would assume that uh, both uh, expert and novice teachers can mm -hmm. be experts at some point. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Do you have any specific examples where uh, expert teachers learn from novice teachers? It was the language well, variation. Yes, I think uh, there was a very interesting uh, conversation where I think they were from China, right? Yes. That they were talking about language varieties in China. And the, so they were having this very interesting dialogue where these Colombian students say, oh, I didn't know about that mm -hmm. language variation in China, and that makes me think mm -hmm. and reflect about this and this. So yeah, there was a mutual learning mm -hmm. uh, for both groups. Would you like to add something? Uh, in that same conversation, I remember one detail was that the, I think, and then the student from UIC said, well, that's sad, I didn't know about those languages because the standard tends to erase all of the non-standard varieties, so I wasn't aware of it. And then in the next response on that thread, then the student from USU didn't address that comment. Stepped around the, the critical uh -oh. comment. But then just did she explained in more detail about uh, varieties and, and how they're used in her context. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Well, thank you so much.